SpaceX is moving full speed ahead with preparations for Starship Flight 10, and the spotlight is now on Ship 37, the upper stage designated for this mission. A critical step in that process is the static fire test, which will occur at the launch site instead of Massey's, due to damage from the Ship 36 explosion last month. This test will be conducted directly on the orbital launch mount, a structure originally built for super-heavy booster firings and orbital launches, not ships. In order to make this work, SpaceX had to engineer a clever workaround. Over the past several weeks, teams have been busy converting a Starship transport stand into a makeshift static fire platform. This required significant structural modifications, including internal bracing to stabilize the Raptor vacuum engines, which are particularly sensitive to thrust displacement due to their large nozzles. They trimmed the stand's legs to fit inside the OLM's confines and added stainless steel panels to cover the openings to prevent engine exhaust from escaping laterally and damaging nearby systems. In parallel, SpaceX also modified the launch mount to accommodate the test stand. All 20 booster hull-down clamps were removed to make space. A hole was cut in the booster quick disconnect hood to route propellant lines to a newly added ship QD system that feeds propellants and gases directly to the ship. The system was recently purge tested with nitrogen gas to confirm that all hardware and software components are functioning correctly. The new ship QD interface, spotted recently at the production site, is expected to be transported and installed shortly. After the modified test stand was ready, it was gently lifted by crane and lowered into position on the OLM. Teams are now securing the stand to ensure it stays anchored during the static fire. Ship 37 is currently housed inside Megabay 2 and is nearing rollout. The vehicle has already received all six Raptor engines, and its forward flaps were recently seen being installed. The aft flaps followed soon after, completing vehicle integration and preparing it for the upcoming static fire. Beach closure notices for July 29th and 30th suggest that SpaceX is targeting early next week for the test. The exact timing remains unconfirmed, but the window aligns with ongoing launch preparations. Ship 37's flight partner, Booster 16, has completed all tests including static fire, and is technically ready for Flight 10. Assuming all systems check out, Flight 10 could lift off in the first half of August. This lines up with Elon Musk's latest projection, and is further supported by a recent FCC filing submitted by SpaceX for communications related to Flight 10. The launch window opens August 4, indicating SpaceX expects integration and vehicle readiness around that date. That said, Final approval will still depend on receiving the green light from the FAA along with necessary airspace and maritime clearances. After Flight 10, attention will turn to Flight 11, featuring Ship 38, the final vehicle in the current Block 2 Starship series. Also located in Megabay 2, Ship 38 recently had surrounding work platforms removed, indicating completion of electrical, hydraulic, and plumbing systems. It is now awaiting cryo-proof testing, which will likely occur only after Flight 10. By the time Flight 11 is completed, SpaceX anticipates that repairs and rebuild at the Massey test site will be finalized. This would free up the orbital launch mount for uninterrupted support of booster testing and launch campaigns. Recovery operations at the Massey test site are progressing steadily. Debris from the Ship 36 explosion has been mostly cleared, and work has shifted to dismantling and replacing damaged ground support infrastructure. At the methane tank farm, damaged components such as vaporizers, pumps, and several vertical storage tanks have already been removed. A new horizontal storage tank has been staged nearby as a likely replacement, with more replacements expected pending ongoing assessments. The original propellant feed lines from the tank farm to the test stand, severely damaged in the blast, have been fully removed. A trench is now being excavated in that area, indicating that SpaceX plans to reroute the new propellant lines underground for added protection against future incidents. Scaffolding around the destroyed static fire stand suggests SpaceX intends to refurbish rather than replace it. Technicians have started removing damaged ship hold down clamps, with further disassembly expected soon. However, the adjacent propellant gantry, which housed the fuel lines, was completely destroyed and will require full reconstruction. Once repairs are complete, Ship 39, the first in the Block 3 Starship series, is expected to be the first vehicle tested at the revamped Massey site. As Massey previously supported only Block 2 vehicles, these repairs are also enabling infrastructure upgrades to handle the larger, more advanced Block 3 hardware. Meanwhile, construction at Pad B is advancing rapidly. A major milestone was recently achieved with the installation of both booster quick disconnect systems on the launch mount. Unlike Pad A's single shared QD, Pad B features separate methane and liquid oxygen QDs, 
allowing for greater thermal isolation, reduced cross-contamination risk, and potentially simpler maintenance. With the QD systems in place, teams have started installing protective hoods to shield them from engine exhaust and weather exposure. Inside the flame trench, steel panels are being laid to guard the floor from intense thermal and acoustic loads during booster ignition. Outside the trench, rebar is being installed for a concrete floor extension designed to redirect and dissipate engine exhaust safely. At the same time, steel cladding is being added to the upper sections of the Pad B launch tower to shield internal components from vehicle exhaust during mid-air recovery operations. The ship quick disconnect arm for Pad B is currently under preparation at the Sanchez site and will be installed later. If construction continues at this pace, Pad B could be operational in four to five months, providing critical redundancy and boosting Starship launch cadence. In a particularly exciting development, SpaceX has successfully recovered the aft section of Super Heavy Booster 13 from the Gulf of Mexico. This booster flew during Starship Flight 6 last November and ended with a soft ocean splashdown after an attempted mid-air catch was aborted due to a failed tower health check. The booster recovery was conducted using the offshore support vessel LBGL, a jack-up platform equipped with heavy-duty cranes for marine retrieval. Although the entire booster wasn't retrieved, the aft section alone offers a unique opportunity for post-flight analysis. Photos of the hardware show all 33 Raptor engines intact, with no visible damage to the engine bells or mounts, an impressive result given the dynamic splashdown. Also visible are the booster header tank and a complex network of propellant lines and valve assemblies, much of which appears well-preserved. One of the most important takeaways from this recovery is the first visual confirmation of the ice filtration screens inside the oxygen tank. Though Elon Musk had previously referenced these features, their design remains speculative until now. So we do, we, we, <laughs> we've improved the sort of uh, ice strainers or the ice catchers. Ice contamination has been a known issue in Starship development. It stems from the autogenous pressurization system, where hot gases tapped from engine processes are routed back into the propellant tanks. The purpose is to maintain ullage pressure inside the tanks, essential to prevent cavitation at the turbopump inlets and to ensure stable, uninterrupted propellant flow to the engines. For the methane tank, pressurization is achieved using heated methane gas from the engine's regenerative cooling system. In contrast, the oxygen tank is pressurized using hot, oxygen-rich pre-burner exhaust. While primarily composed of oxygen, this exhaust also contains small amounts of carbon dioxide and water vapor, combustion byproducts generated in the pre-burner. In the tank's cryogenic environment, these vapors rapidly condense. Water forms ice and CO2 solidifies into dry ice. The denser dry ice particles settle at the bottom of the tank, where they risk clogging the inlet filters that supply oxidizer to the Raptor engines, leading to engine shutdowns, as observed in earlier booster flights. To mitigate this, SpaceX developed a multi-layer stainless steel mesh filtration system installed across the tank's cross-section. This mesh captures solid contaminants before they can accumulate at the tank's base and obstruct propellant flow to the engines. The recovered aft section of Booster 13 offers the first direct visual confirmation of this filtration system, previously only theorized. For a more detailed breakdown of its design and function, refer to the CSI Starbase deep dive linked in the video description. After recovery, the booster hardware was transported to the port of Brownsville and then moved to Starbase for analysis. Additional sections of Booster 13 could still be retrieved, offering further insights into splashdown survivability. This isn't SpaceX's first ocean recovery. Booster 11 from Flight 4 was also retrieved, but in far worse condition, with much of the aft section and several engines missing. In contrast, Booster 13's intact Raptors and preserved internal systems offer a much richer engineering dataset. These recoveries allow SpaceX to evaluate structural integrity, engine survivability, thermal and mechanical loads, and avionics durability under splashdown conditions, which follow steeper, uncontrolled re-entry trajectories and subject the booster to significantly greater stress than the more controlled descent profiles used for tower catch landings. Every recovered component provides real-world data that will directly inform future Starship flights. Meanwhile, Mexican authorities have alleged that the Booster 13 recovery vessel operated illegally in their territorial waters. According to officials, the vessel had been working roughly 12 nautical miles off the coast since July 16 without the necessary permits, and they warned that sanctions would be imposed on those responsible. This isn't the first tension between Mexico and SpaceX. After the Ship 36 explosion at the Massey's test site, reports emerged claiming that debris and possibly contamination had crossed into Mexican territory. 
Although SpaceX denied any violations, Mexican officials launched an investigation and cautioned the company about respecting national sovereignty and environmental safety. Now, the vessel incident has reignited those concerns. While SpaceX has already removed the vessel, the backlash underscores increasing government sensitivity to foreign aerospace operations in proximity to the national border. In a concerning development, an unusual fluid discharge was observed late Wednesday night at the under-construction Starship Launch Tower at Kennedy Space Center's LC-39A, with visible pooling at its base and near the chopstick arms. It remains unclear whether this was planned venting or an accidental leak. However, since no such activity has been recorded at SpaceX's Starbase Towers, this behavior appears anomalous. Based on the systems typically present in the structure, potential causes include a hydraulic fluid leak or a drainage-related issue. But given that the flow lasted for nearly three hours, far longer than any hydraulic system could sustain, a leak of that nature seems unlikely. Given the mist-like appearance of the leak, the most plausible explanation is a malfunction in the site's dewatering or plumbing system, possibly involving rainwater or construction runoff. A pressure imbalance, clog, or valve failure might have caused this leak. More details may emerge in the coming days. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. SpaceX successfully launched NASA's Tracer's mission from Vandenberg Space Force Base on July 23 to study the origins of the solar wind and its impact on Earth. The mission also carried five rideshare payloads. 55 minutes after liftoff, deployment of the twin Tracer satellites and rideshare payloads began, with all satellites released over the next 50 minutes, successfully completing the mission. The Tandem Reconnection and CUSP Electrodynamics Reconnaissance Satellites, or TRACERS, is a major leap in heliophysics aimed at studying magnetic reconnection. This phenomenon happens when the interplanetary magnetic field carried by the solar wind, a stream of charged particles from the sun, collides with Earth's magnetosphere. When oppositely directed magnetic field lines meet, they can break and reconnect explosively, releasing massive energy. This energy accelerates charged particles along Earth's magnetic field lines into the magnetospheric cusps, funnel-shaped regions near the poles where solar wind can directly enter the atmosphere. The result is auroras, but also potential threats to satellites and ground-based systems. Tracers includes two identical satellites flying in tandem in a sun-synchronous orbit at 600 km altitude. Separated by 75 to 900 kilometers, they observe the same region of the magnetospheric cusp at slightly different times, helping distinguish spatial from temporal variations in magnetic reconnection. Each satellite carries five instruments to collect thousands of measurements during repeated cusp passes over a 12-month mission. This tandem setup offers a continuous, step-by-step -step view of reconnection unlike earlier missions limited to brief snapshots. These observations will help scientists build more accurate models of space weather, improve our understanding of solar terrestrial interactions, and better protect modern technology from geomagnetic disruptions. The Tracer's mission didn't fly alone, it shared its Falcon 9 ride with five rideshare payloads, each showcasing unique space technology. Leading the lineup is Athena Epic, a small satellite from NASA Langley designed to test a modular, plug-and-play approach to satellite integration, aimed at reducing cost and deployment time for remote sensing instruments. Alongside it is the Polylingual Experimental Terminal Satellite, developed by NASA and Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. This technology demonstrator tests an advanced communications terminal that can seamlessly switch between government and commercial satellite networks, like a roaming cell phone in space enabling real-time data exchange across diverse systems, a first-of-its-kind capability. Also on board is the Realistic Electron Atmospheric Loss, or REAL, CubeSat, focused on measuring how electrons escape from Van Allen radiation belts into the Earth's atmosphere, contributing to our understanding of space weather, satellite lifespans, and atmospheric chemistry. LIDE, or Direct Access Live Demonstration Transponder, is a lesser documented but intriguing rideshare payload believed to test next-generation satellite communication and data relay technologies, though specific mission details remain limited. Rounding out the manifest is Skycraft 4, an Australian-built satellite contributing to a space-based global air traffic control system by enabling real-time communication between pilots and ground stations. Altogether, NASA's Tracer's mission and the rideshare companions together form a landmark venture into studying, protecting, and better utilizing the dynamic space environment around Earth. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.